Okay. Everybody, welcome to our panel discussion. We have a whole bunch of great people here to answer what seems to be a whole bunch of interesting questions. I'll start off with letting people introduce themselves. So just give your name, institution, and a kind of one sentence takeaway from your talk. And Drew, if that doesn't apply to you, but you can figure out something. So I'll go ahead and start with Chelsea, since you just finished up. Hi hey everyone, I'm Chelsea, I'm at Stanford, and I just talked about how we can broaden robot data to get robots to generalize much better. Costantinos. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm Konstantinos Busmalis, I'm a, I'm a research scientist at DeepMind, and I talked about uh, cross embodiment uh, imitation. Alexandra. Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Faust. I'm a research scientist at uh, Google Brain, and I talked about uh, how to train autonomous robot navigation scalably. Sonia. Uh, hi, I'm Sonia. I'm associate professor at the University of Toronto, and also lead a research lab at NVIDIA in Toronto. And I talked about different approaches to simulation. Akshara. Hi everyone, I'm Akshara. I'm a research scientist at uh, Facebook AI Research, and I talked about how to teach legged robots to perceive their environments and adapt to what they see. Anka? Hi, I'm Anka Dagan from UC Berkeley, and I talked about uh, getting robots and AI agents to assist people, and in particular, how we might do that differently than just inferring the person's intent and then helping them do that and essentially doing that for them, and instead sort of empowerment-based formulations of assistance. Hoyun, I think that's how I say your name. Please correct me. Yeah, this is Hyo. I usually go by Hyo, and uh, I'm at Stanford, and my talk was on how human, especially children, learn from others, help others learn, and I was basically running my imagination wild in terms of how we can get machines to do something similar. Peter? Uh, Peter, we can't hear you at the moment. Oops, still nothing. You are unmuted, but probably Zoom is not using the correct microphone. Sometimes it has Zoom audio device or something near. All right, I've tried switching mics again. Does that work okay? That's good. Okay, sorry, Bob. Uh, no problem. So, um, Peter Anderson from Google. Uh, so, my talk was about building massive data sets for language guided navigation agents. Andrew. Uh, Hi hey folks, I'm Rubatra. I'm a faculty member at Georgia Tech and a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. And my role here is that I was shepherding the conference organizers. I'm not an organizer or a panelist. I'm mostly just making sure this thing runs. <laughs> ah, appreciated. Okay. So we'll get going with some questions here. So one question is kind of on the contention of hierarchical RL. This is directed somewhat at Akshara, but I think everybody can have some input here. Which is so in hierarchical RL, often the low level controller, the low level agent is frozen before you train some top level controller on it. And while this makes sense, it's somewhat dissatisfying. So, what do people think is the bottleneck of being able to get to possibly training these together in the loop? Or, it, or if we can get past that, does it just become a kind of single end to end system that doesn't necessarily have hierarchy in it without this freezing? Actually, yeah. So Maria, I can start with, yeah, basically some experience that we have with this. So agreed completely, this is very unsatisfying overall. And um, we're basically constraining our search space on hardware often to whatever we have learned in simulation for our low level policies. And as you can imagine, if your low level policies are not learned properly, there's not much that you can do on your high level, which will result in good behavior basically, if your low-level policies are not trained properly. So yeah, definitely, I think freezing your low-level policy is a very unsatisfying way of doing this. Um, I think that what we 
need to do here is probably a more iterative approach in uh, that we are kind of using offline data and online data to update our low level policies as we are getting more data rather than do an end to end planning, uh, uh, learning approach basically, uh, which will be much more sample efficient and does not necessarily generalize. So I think modularity still has a lot of benefits, uh, especially with regards to generalization and cross embodied um, learning and data sharing. Um, and we should still exploit that, but instead of freezing our low-level policies, uh, we could probably do a more iterative approach of updating the low-level policies based on information we are getting as we are, you know, unrolling things on hardware. I completely agree for what it's worth. <laughs> the, I think one reason we're not doing this is because it's more of the engineering challenge than anything else. And, the, and we should be doing more of that. The, on the other hand, the modularity does help. If we have a full end-to-end -end system, then we're risking into being able to solve one complex use case very well without being able to reuse the policies. So we, I think the ideal scenario would be having multi-headed multitask higher level policies that, that are running on top of the lower single lower level policy and training at the same time. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with uh, with that. Uh, just speaking, having worked with Sandra on this, this is, uh, it, it's challenging getting them to learn at the same time, uh, but having something multi-headed where you're, the, the core is learning the same thing is uh, a good approach. So kind of in a similar vein to this, um, there, there are a lot of different sources of potential supervision in embodied AI. This comes down to reward and different shaping, actions and demonstrations, be that from oracles or humans and potentially self-supervised sources. What should we be focusing on this? Is there one of those that's more particular than the other or are these things kind of all together that have their own importances and we probably need to bring them all into one to be able to get to where we want to go. I can maybe start taking a pass at that. Um, I think in our experiences so far, uh, especially when it comes to just information about the reward function. So uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that RL works. And if you have a reward function, everything works out great. And then, you know, the rest of you are going to figure out how to make that work. And then I'm going to say that for the reward function itself, we don't know what it is. Right. And so Traditionally, we use demonstrations, um, but uh, but demonstrations are very limiting, not just because people are suboptimal and so on, but also because demonstrations, if you think about it, they only compare the optimal or approximately optimal thing to do with everything else, but they don't pro provide you much information about how different suboptimal things compare, right? And so when you don't have that information, well, you don't need it to just imitate the policy to imitate the demonstration, but if you want the reward function that has a hope at sort of transferring to other, other environments, now you're in trouble. And so um, we have definitely seen that there's pros and cons in terms of their informativeness, but also the completeness essentially of different forms of feedback. And surprisingly, we found that uh, there's a lot of kind of hidden sources of feedback that we weren't thinking about yet. My favorite example is this idea that uh, that my student Rohan Shah came up with, which is that uh, you, um, you can take a look at the environment and that itself provides information about what the reward function should be because people have been acting in that environment. You haven't observed those actions, so you haven't gone demonstrations, right? But they've been already shaping their environment to sort of be to their liking. And that informs you about stuff that you probably shouldn't do. So if I'm put, an, put a bunch of effort into creating something, you should probably not just knock it down. Um, and so there's kind of hidden information. I like to talk about leaked information from people. People leak information the way they react and the way they set up their world and so on and so forth. And it really feels like we should be reading into all of that as well. So I think the answer sort of is that one type is, is um, 
probably not optimal if you combine the sample complexity and the need to actually disambiguate the reward function. Um, and I could imagine that you can sort of generalize that to learning about the task in general beyond the reward. Social norms that you're referring to. That in, the, in, the, in these applications, not just enough to complete a task, but how the task is completed is very important and is contextual. Yeah, and I think that even um, just to kind of add on to what Sandra said, I think in in RL, we tend to kind of kid to ourselves that the task is easy to specify, but maybe there's, you know, pesky users that have preferences. But in my experience, I don't know how to set up a reward function for an actual autonomous car that needs to face any environment and, and that reward function has to incentivize the correct behavior everywhere. Like that's a joke, I cannot write that down. There's no way that I could possibly do this. Um, and so, and I can take any time, even something like grasping, right? It's just, it, 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 if you really wanna do the real complex task, then I think we kind of have to stop kidding ourselves that we can actually write down that the specification of the task is fine, but then maybe there's nuances in, you know, users, preferences, et cetera. If forget about users, just us as designers, we, we, you know, we specify stuff and we get it wrong all the time. And so I think we kind of have to, to think beyond, um, to think about this, these no notions of learning reward functions, even for um, just the vanilla tasks that have nothing to do with people. On that note, I think that task specification is like in general a very underrated problem. I think that there's so much work on reinforcement learning and optimization of behavior. And in comparison to that, like the amount of work that and people studying task specification is so much smaller. Um, and I do think that we don't, part of the challenge is we don't even know what the right problem formulation is. And like, we don't have a, a clean problem statement. And I think that's good. I think that we need more research on different problem settings, like the problem settings that Anka was mentioning of like inferring these sorts of rewards or inferring preferences from the state of the world, for example. Um, and I think that we shouldn't just pick one. I don't think there is one best one. I think that we, there's pros and cons of each. And as a community, we should be open to a variety of different formulations that people are exploring because we haven't really figured out the best formulation uh, of the problem and, and that figuring out the problem is part of the research. Just jumping off of what everyone was saying, just from uh, the perspective of somebody who studies humans and especially children, I think it's absolutely right that the task specification is an, uh, a problem that is kind of a giant in the room that uh, we are not really talking about. But if you just look at what children are doing, there's no such thing as like starting and ending. Uh, it's all something that we have defined for ourselves. I'm gonna say I'm starting now. I'm gonna say that I'm ending now. So this is something that agents can, can set for their own. In of something that's been imposed by an external world. Of course, there's schools and homeworks and assignments that kind of impose these for learning, which is something that we're trying to impose on uh, robots, for instance. But I think it's important to think about that. And also just think, thinking about reward function specification, uh, humans are incredibly good at uh, balancing across different kinds of goals and knowing what to do in a given moment. And in the talk, I was briefly mentioning this example of a baby that's failing to do something, but then depending on why the baby thinks uh, he or she's failing, they either seek for help. Oh, I, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. So I'm going to ask for help right now. And that's what I should be doing. Or, oh, I think this is broken. So I'm going to go look for uh, towards, uh, I'm going to go towards something that's seemingly working. So trying to figure out what to do in a given moment and trying to generate the specific reward functions for the specific goal that I'm trying to achieve seems to be something that uh, I would love to see uh, more progress on. And I think for this, it would be great to see more cognitive scientists and people who study humans talking to uh, more uh, people who are developing AI. I, just to add, I think one, one elephant in the room is that we have a fundamental gap in the abstraction level between POM MDPs and MDPs that are used for sequential decision making, whether you use RL or whatever technique for learning uh, we might be using. But then the, the practical problems we're trying to solve, 
do not fit the POM MDP mode. We're talking multitask, we're talking multi-environment, right? There is no abstraction for environment <laughs> in, in MDP. Uh, there is the, the rewards are a lot complex. Task specification does not exist in POM MDP and so on. So focusing on kind of figuring out what is the right abstraction to do these applied problems and then do a translation of the world in POM MDP is really where this, we call it seems to real gap in its protection, practitioners a poor, uh, approach without kind of having a lot of fundamental principles developed yet. I'll say one very quick last thing, because uh, this is probably my favorite topic, <laughs> um, which is that if you're in the audience and you're sort of new to this area of learning from human feedback, we try to write up a tutorial that might hopefully be useful to you. It's called Reward Rational Implicit Choice. It's kind of like a survey of, here's how you can think of all these different feedback types, and here's kind of a unified framework um, in which you can kind of see them as doing all the same thing. So you can start being able to combine them and do active learning among them and so on. So if, if you're interested in kind of learning more about the space, Reward Rational Implicit Choice is the tutorial that we wrote up to, to try to help with that. So Peter and Sonia, uh, one common theme from both of your talks is imagining the environment. How far do you think this can be pushed and what do you think the limitation of this is? Sorry, can you say again, what was the question? I didn't yeah, uh, one common theme between you and Peter's talks is imagining the environment. How far do you think that can be pushed and what do you think kind of the core technical limitation is of imagining the environment and training agents within that? You mean like generative models of, of the world? Yeah, yeah, generative models of the world or like it doesn't necessarily have to be at the level of pixels or something like that. It can be in some latent space, etc. Yeah, I kind of believe in that approach because, you know, in my head, I, I can imagine a lot of things. So, there, you know, I, I am building an environment of the world. Uh, however, there's also limitations, right? Because um, uh, right now we can only imagine things we have seen so because it's all data driven, right? So if we haven't seen certain accidents occur, or like if, if we're talking about you know, autonomous driving or illegal maneuvers, we can never imagine that, right? So there probably is also need for engineer, like human engineering, you know, game engines that can kind of counter that and imagine things that we know can happen, but maybe we haven't physically encountered. Um, so that would, I guess, be my answer to kind of counter both approaches, right? So human engineering, how the model should look like and, and learning from data. So I'm, um, I guess, continue to be amazed by the, the trend towards training vision and language models on web data. And this, this trend just keeps going and going. And the performance of these image text models is just surprisingly good. And so to me, this motivates a kind of desire to want to do something similar in embodied AI, but of course we can't just get on the web and find trajectories and, you know, instructions or, you know, whatever type of training data we're looking for. So, so to me, that's the motivation for this sort of generative approach. And my opinion is that the sweet spot is where you're taking some sort of web data as initialization to a generative model, but then you're using the generative model to sort of fill in the gaps to maybe, you know, resample some video from YouTube in the action space of the agent that you want to train and, and that type of thing. Um, the limitation, one limitation of this is putting expensive generative models in your training loop is, uh, you know, is going to be pretty expensive and looking at all the work that folks have done on things like Habitat to kind of speed up the frame rates and the benefits that has provided, I think, you know, clearly shows that that's important. Um, just recently, I was excited by the decision transformer and trajectory transformer sorts of models because uh, I guess one advantage of, of those types of approaches is that it's effectively imitation learning and you can kind of pre-generate all your trajectories without doing it in the, uh, in the training loop. So, yeah, I guess that's a potential limitation, but, but you know, there may be ways to get around that. I can also comment on this because I, I also have done a lot of work on, on generative models, including some of what I included in my talk. Um, 
I, like I mentioned in the talk, I think that underfitting is one challenge. And also like, like Peter mentioned, I think that like these models are expensive. And so using them in the loop uh, can be challenging. Um, if you can get a good latent space model, then that actually is a huge win in terms of speed, because then you can potentially just put everything in the latent space and then have this much faster latent space model. And we've seen some benefits there, including in the, the first part of the work that I talked about with collecting the data. Um, one, I think, underrated benefit of these models uh, is that they're actually very interpretable. Um, you can look at the predictions and see what the model is thinking, quote unquote. And um, in the real world, this is super, super valuable because actually running the robot in the real world is super expensive. Uh, and so you don't actually have to do that to understand roughly its performance. Um, this is, I mean, if you're working in simulation, this is less important because you can just run your policy in simulation and get an evaluation directly. But in the real world, getting that sort of evaluation of your policy is really difficult. And so being able to look at the predictions and what the model kind of knows and so forth is really useful because if it doesn't know how the object is going to like be pushed when you move your arm, then it's certainly not going to be able to figure out how to interact with that object um, with planning and policy optimization. And maybe just that. So one thing that is really nice about these generative models of the world is they're differentiable, right? So suddenly you have a differentiable representation of the world, right? So for example, in any of these robotics uh, applications that maybe some intervention happens or something like that, it's really key that you go and reproduce that scenario in simulation so you can test again or maybe even tra train again. And if you have this kind of differentiable simulation where you can recover some of the, the parameters, you can re-simulate very easily, I think it's, it's, it's like a huge win. To add to, to that, uh, we've also had a lot of pleasant experiences with being using, leveraging the fact that this is, these are differentiable, just to be able to actually directly optimize over environments to put the robot in to then have a human look at and say, oh, no, 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 do not do that. And so you can actually do active learning over this stuff. And it really kind of cuts down the sample complexities and the unwanted accidents at deployment time, in my experience. Costantinos, do you have a perspective on this of how it might tie into, uh, yeah, as an interpretability thing, probing the agent's knowledge and beliefs about the environment? I think it's a. I think interpretability is a is a big issue here, uh, so, and I think um, I, I don't know exactly how how people deal with interpretability when um, uh, they generate latent uh, samples, uh, but I think there are obvious advantages to, to using latent, latent samples. And if interpretability for latent samples is improved, I think that would be, uh, that, that would be another path here, potentially. So your argument here would be potentially to generate in kind of like observation space that way, because that gives you interpretability quite easily. Well, so generating in observation space, because the, the obvious advantage is that you can actually look at the data uh, before before you use that before you use that to, for training, but uh, it also comes with um, um, a, a big sizes, right? So if being able to have concise uh, codes, latent codes that represent that data, and being able to um, reason uh, about about your scene in, in that latent representation is, is is preferable if you had some way to actually make that interpretable as well. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if there's a lot of work on actually uh, uh, making, uh, producing latent codes that are also interpretable. I don't know if others uh, in this panel uh, are aware of, of, of such works, uh, but I think that would be that would be a, a, an, an interesting path. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, I'm actually quite excited about how interpretable these generative models are. So uh, particularly the ones that we were using, so generating the, the images, so the pixels themselves, so the kind of the thesis is that if you're able to generate like an entire image that looks realistic, then that generative model, the feature presentations inside know a lot of things, know about, you know, lighting, geometry, semantics. And, you know, then we have all seen this latent codes being interpolated and everything in between also looks great. So there's some correspondences that these generative models actually find across maybe many different examples. 
So it turns out that now if you just add like very tiny ML piece on top of those latent codes and just label that output, like the image, you need like super little training data, super little annotations and it kind of just propagates that information across the latent space, which is I think like a huge win um, because suddenly you can go like a hundred X less label data by just basically leveraging these generative models. Um, I wanted to add one point to the interpretability part of the later model. So something that we have looked into is kind of uh, for robotics applications, as Chansi said, it's actually really hard to um, unroll a policy that you learned in simulation on hardware um, because, you know, um, the system has to be more safe than, you know, as you would be in simulation. But something we've looked into is kind of uh, learning latent representations at a higher level and then unrolling them in simulation to uh, get an estimate of kind of what kind of behaviors do we expect on hardware uh, on the real robot. So for example, if some parts of your space in this reduced order space are just uh, you know, producing random motions of your arms and legs, you probably don't want to search in the space on hardware. But on the other hand, if you're actually getting uh, reasonable behaviors um, in simulation um, in uh, some part of your space, then you can use this for also informing this, um, the search that you will do on hardware. So some part of interpretability in these latent actions would also probably be added by building simulators for whatever environment you're interested in, I imagine. Oh, yeah, I have a two-part question for you. Um, so do infants learn to evaluate their teachers? And if so, is there evidence that they act on this information to kind of re-rate their, their teachers and use that to aid in them learn? And then to the rest of the group, if this is the case or if this isn't the case, is this something that we should try and do in ML systems of evaluating teachers and then trying to re-rate the teachings based on that? Yeah, so I can speak to the first part first. Uh, so some of the studies I talked about today, uh, especially on the, the how they interpret signals from humans and how they make use of it. Some of these come from infants and some of these come from older children. The studies I talked about in terms of explicitly evaluating or labeling a teacher as unhelpful or less helpful, not as good. These are coming more from uh, children who are older than three, four, at least years of age. And some of the studies uh, that we won't uh, find success until five or six years of age, which says something uh, quite a lot about what is involved in these kinds of tasks. A, you have to know something and remember that in order to be able to evaluate whether a person provided helpful information, because otherwise you're just learning from them. There's no way for you to evaluate if you don't know the truth about the world. And second, I think there's a lot of perhaps something like a default assumption that children have when you're seeing something coming from uh, adults in, especially in a pedagogical context. This person is trying to tell you that this, uh, I know something, I wanna tell you something. It's really hard for children to override the, that default assumption unless they have a lot of evidence. So uh, being able to evaluate, evaluate somebody who calls a shoe a horse uh, that comes earlier compared to uh, saying that, oh, if you didn't show me all four, you showed me all uh, just one. That seems to be emerging a little later. So a lot of these are not coming from infants, but there's also a lot of work showing that even very young infants are sensitive to people who are acting ir irrationally for in, in terms of their inefficiency. So they're paying attention to what others are doing and they're constantly assessing whether that person seems to be acting in the world in a way that is consistent with what they think about what humans or human agents should do. So uh, I think what this says is that uh, human agents do seem to be uh, having some very initial set of assumptions or um, some kind of generative model. We talked about the generative models of the world, but there's certainly generative models of how people act, think, and plan. And they seem to be growing over time in a way that makes their predictions richer and the way in which they respond to other people's actions much richer. So that's one thing I could say, and I'll leave it to the other uh, panel speakers for uh, addressing the second part of that question. So for the second part of that question, I think there are already uh, RL methods like uh, AWR, or CRR, advanced weighted regression, or uh, 
creating uh, regularized regression that evaluate that evaluate the information that comes from say a teacher policy or multiple teachers policies and adjust how much the specific supervision affects training i have not seen something that does that at the teacher level but um, maybe that's not necessary uh, if you can actually evaluate the specific supervision that you're getting uh, for a specific state list there's um there's maybe two problems here there's one thing that you can do when going back to our previous discussion you know the reward function then it's pretty easy to say oh in in hindsight this sucked versus this was very good because you can actually evaluate teacher policies using the reward function you have but if you're so if you're doing you know teaching, learning from humans to speed stuff up in RL, then I think we're in good shape with that. If you're doing learning from humans because you don't know what you should be doing in the first place, so you don't know what the reward function is, then it becomes a little harder because you don't know whether something goes good at that or bad. Um, one thing, one idea there um, that could be helpful is to jointly infer the reward and the teacher's rationality level. So typically when we learn from people, we the way we connect the rewards, right? What they want to teach us with, with the, the actions or the feedback we're observing from them is through some kind of rationality, approximate rationality, biased rationality, whatever kind of model like that. And, and then you kind of have this kind of cool opportunity to not just infer the reward function, but to jointly infer distribution over the reward function and the teacher rationality. Now, this is a joint distribution, so we'll have ambiguity, right? You can come up with explanations that are like either the task is this and the person is really rational or they're crazy for this other task. And, and both of those explanations are super valid. So it doesn't just completely solve the problem, but then but you at least kind of can, you know, you can then use that joint distribution to sort of plan an expectation or to, to sort of hedge your bets, do some sort of um, a worst case uh, um, uh, risk averse optimization, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, um, just one small point, uh, like completely agree with what Anka and Konstantino said, right? And I think when we have human demonstrations, maybe in a way we don't even need to think about if they are good or bad, because they might be good for some settings while being bad for other settings. And it makes sense to kind of get um, maybe like an offline policy kind of a, a setting with human demonstrations in which you're just getting skills out of it. Um, and then depending on whatever task you have in the future, you choose out of those skills, which ones would be most suitable for the new task that we have at hand. Just to close the loop on that, um, I was watching Chelsea's talk and there was this example of uh, humans providing interesting examples. Uh, and, and, and then the robot uh, performs a lot better and, and, and then it opens and closes the drawer. And then I was imagining like, what if in addition to that, there was a human, I, I know there's like hours and hours of uh, uh, data there. So it's hard for humans to observe the entire thing, but what if humans can label certain discrete uh, sort of segments of that as, hey, that's called open opening the drawer, hey, that's called closing the drawer. And in order for agents that are behaving in real world environments, <clears throat> and then hopefully assisting at some point with real world tasks, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll be really important and interesting for those machines to be able to uh, learn from human feedback. Hey, that was good. Or hey, that wasn't as good. And in order in, in, in real world environments, it would be nice if they could distinguish between people who are actually providing useful feedback versus kids that's just kind of you know running around with the robots and not really providing feedback, but kind of things that they can ignore. So being able to jointly infer uh, specific individuals in terms of their informativity or usefulness for their feedback would be a really nice feature eventually to uh, imagine. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I agree with that. I guess one thing that I'll add to that too is um, we actually have some work that we submitted to Coral very recently and will be out soon on um, giving that sort of feedback actually in the form of natural language where you collect data and then just have, um, we use crowdsourcing because we have a lot of data um, just to kind of say, okay, what did the human, what did the robot do in that case? What, what, like, what did it look like and so forth? And um, I do think that natural language may provide a, a useful interface for providing supervision to robots um, and conveying information because it's uh, 
it's a very flexible thing. Like we can describe a lot of things it turns out with language and, um, and also it's a very easy medium for humans to provide feedback compared to things like demonstrations and so forth. Um, and beyond the work that we have coming out, there's also um, of course, like a lot of literature on language and RL more generally as well. And if we look at the very first part of this question of what the children do, just in case people don't know, um, there are these awesome studies done in the 80s by Andrew Meltzoff, which basically show that if you have, at some point, I don't remember the number of months, maybe 14 months old, um, if, if you do a task in uh, an irrational way that the infant can't really explain as you had a reason for doing it that way, they'll actually imitate the kind of the correct, the intent um, and do it in the rational way. The example is with uh, pressing a button and you're not pressing with your hand, you're pressing it with your head. And in one condition, you have a reason to press it with your head. Your hands are tied behind you in a blanket or something like that. And then the infant actually just figures out, oh, you want to press the button and then they press, they press the button with their hands. And that's, I think that's a super cool thing that we develop at, you know, probably not six months of age, but 14 months of age, where we already have that ability to say, you've done it in a weird way, but I'm going to do it the better way. So just to add on to what Anka was saying, uh, I, I, the, Andy Melsoff did a lot of studies uh, from the 80s, in, including facial expression imitation. The blanket study is from uh, Gergely Chivra and uh, Gergely, uh, the uh, a team in Hungary. And what exactly, as you say, what they have shown in that study is that goal uh, inference really matters in terms of when they imitate, what they imitate, and depending on what they think the person's goal is, they will either uh, like do the exact uh, way of imitating the person's behavior or try to just go ahead and achieve the goal if they think uh, they don't have to do it because that person's actions were constrained. So this is like a combination of action perception and understanding that that person's, a, uh, that person's action space is constrained, but mine is not. And therefore I don't need uh, to imitate that person, but I'm just going to emulate that goal instead of uh, just copying the behavior. But there are cases where that's important. And even then they're not blindly copying, they are doing, uh, achieving the goal in the same manner as the humans did, or as the, uh, the adults did, because they believe that that's how the toy works. So even though their action space is not constrained at all, they will still use their head to uh, um, uh, activate that light. So thanks for bringing that up, Anka. Kind of a question to everybody. How important do you think big data is for embodied AI and how feasible do you think it is? Peter's talk in particular kind of posited that it would certainly make things easier, but does that distract us from moving towards human level sample efficiency? So um, I think that this question, like really depends on what you mean by big. I think that uh, two hours of data personally is like, I, I just don't think that's enough. Uh, like humans, well, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on humans, but humans clearly seem to need more than two hours of data. Um, and so I think that uh, we need to be in settings where it is much more than that. Um, I, personally, if we want robots to generalize in ways that are meaningful and actually could have the potential to go into the real world, um, I think that data efficiency is important, but I think that in particular, online data efficiency is really important. Uh, the amount of new data that it has to collect um, and in order to get to big data, I think that we need to be using large offline data sets and then potentially a small amount of online data uh, for the particular scenario. Yeah, that's a fair point to start with also of are humans actually data efficient? I was just about to say that human sample efficiency is actually, um, we should take into account uh, that there is such a paradigm of of what just uh, Chelsea just described, right? So there is a lot of data, a lot of experience that comes from years of living in this world. And this would be kind of the offline setting, the sim setting uh, that we would want our models to be able to utilize so that the online, the expensive uh, uh, data efficiency is low. So I'm obviously in the pro big data camp here, I guess. Um, it was a feature of my talk. Um, I do think there's a bit of a tendency for us to 
you know, maybe put more of our focus as a community on building models as opposed to worrying about the data that they're trained on. We sort of get a benchmark academic data set and we run with it as hard as we can and, uh, you know, maybe don't consider um, just, you know, making that larger. And that doesn't necessarily mean spending money, but I think if some of the cleverness we put into the modeling was instead focused towards, you know, cleverness in terms of how we generate synthetic data from, um, you know, resources that are available perhaps, then, uh, you know, we might find there's some inroads we can make there. The other thing that I'll add is I think that the, like you need to be thinking about data efficiency with respect to the complexity and breadth of the problem. Um, if you need like, um, like I think that big data is is a good thing. Uh, I think that like, especially like large offline data sets, but if you're using a huge offline data set to get like a cheetah to run forward in a fixed environment, that's like not what I'm talking about. Uh, Cause I think that um, that's just like, we, we need big but broad data sets and, and to try to learn kind of uh, things that generalize very broadly from such data sources. And so it's a matter of, uh, of um, what things look like. I hope Sandra is okay. Sandra, are you okay? Hope the crisis is manageable. Uh, just, just to add on to what Konstantinos and what Chelsea was saying, I also wanna add that human sampling is efficient, uh, not only because they did have a lot of data from their whole lives, but also perhaps we should think about how their knowledge is structured and how they're getting used at every single moment of the day when they're trying to decide what to do and how to interpret this person's action or I'm looking at a scene, uh, what am I looking at? And, and once you have an understanding of, uh, once you have that kind of structured theory, like uh, knowledge of how the world works and how people work, then a lot of uh, things that you observe in terms of people's actions and what you see in the world makes so much better sense. And you're able to focus on the right way or right dimensions of the images or scenes that you're seeing. You can generate uh, more informative alternative uh, hypotheses in terms of what you are trying to uh, learn from. So I think I also want to uh, draw attention to that aspect of uh, how humans store and use the observed data in addition to just the fact that they do have a lot of data or have had a lot of data. Eric, can I, can I press on that question for a little bit more clarification? Yeah. Um, so uh, to follow up on that on that direction, I think we have good ideas or good sources for how to scale web scale data, uh, images, videos, uh, text captured by people, uploaded online, um, made available for offline tasks. I think we have good ideas there and good sources there. I think we have okay ideas on how to get simulation data. It's not infinite, but you know, diversity is limited, but we have some good ideas there. I don't think I know good ideas to scale hardware experiments other than robot farms, which get limited. And I have particularly a hard time thinking about how to scale human robot interaction type experiments where it's not the same as connecting mechanical Turk to a chatbot. So those two, like, do people have better ideas? Like how do we scale that? to the extent we believe in the scaling hypothesis that if we can get 100x more data of that kind, things will work better. I, I can start. And I'm, I'm sure, th I mean, th this is a great question and everybody's gonna have different experience. The one thing I think that we can do is that we establish the differences in kind of statistical matter between simulation experiments and on robot experiments. And if we can establish that, okay, maybe our simulation experiments across a set of environments and whatnot are within three to 5% or so on, so we have margin of error, then we can kind of start more evaluating in simulation with the idea that yes, this, that this transfers. I think also as a community, robotics community in particular, we need more of the physical test beds. So supercomputing 
back in the day, community had these large data centers where researchers can go and submit their jobs in simulation that, that actually propelled. Robotics does not have anything like that. There is not a large scale physical test bed that we can do <coughs> and submit jobs in simulation. Once they pass this test, then you submit them on the physical robots in, in a test bed and so on. And that's a serious conversation to have across the community. But <laughs> So I would, I would argue that I think that maybe there's a chance that we don't actually need a large physical test bed of robots. I think that collectively across all of the institutions that have robots, we actually have a pretty large number of robots overall. And the problem is that the kind of the paradigm in robot learning is to literally throw away your data after every single paper and every single experiment. And um, I think that if we can figure out how to stop throwing away that data and um, figure out how to reuse it across experiments, across papers, and essentially do kind of reinforcement learning across papers, maybe we can um, get towards the, the data that we have. I also think the good news is that robots can collect their data without humans um, in principle. So if we can figure out, um, if we can figure out how to allow them to have greater autonomy, then we might be in better shape. Uh, Charles, just to clarify, my point of view comes from navigation where it's very hard to replicate same conditions. In manipulation tasks, you can have more similar physical settings that can be compared in different institutions and so on. With, with navigation experiments, the environments are just so large that, I don't know, maybe there is a value. One of the things that we've been trying to do um, with uh, the navigation group that Sandra and I were part of in Google is to actually build out the ability to do these experiments. And it's painful. It takes a, a good bit of time to build the infrastructure to make that necessary. Um, and it's always, you know, seems better to get the next paper out. But it's also a finite problem. And after having spent some time doing this, we had the, the pleasure of recent, running a recent experiment where I literally was able to, to roll things out like almost immediately in the same pipeline that all the other experiments were running and we can collate the data against each other. So it, it, it's a painful step to go through as uh, a, a research community because it's more like the development than the research. But if you can make the investment, um, it's worthwhile. The one caveat is, is when you start to try to bring in humans and human appearance into it, um, getting a, large numbers of people whom we have the right to use their faces, you know, the, without deep blurring and so on, that's another engineering challenge because ideally you would love to deploy many, many robots and then just see how they interact with people and use those tracks. But there are legal, you know, things to consider. Um, and when you start trying to use that in experimental data and association with an academic institution, you know, th there's experiment review boards. I think these problems are solvable and we should, and, and I don't think we should be daunted by the fact that there may be a few hurdles to overcome. I, I think I will give a more controversial opinion here and then hopefully everybody doesn't jump on me, but I actually think that uh, we should reason about what space we want to get this big data in uh, because in robotics, we do have um, you know, a lot of knowledge about the system that we are operating on. Uh, so we have the dynamics model of our robots, we have physical simulations, and yes, simulations are not perfect. Um, there's a lot of uh, things to work on there. But um, I think it's worth thinking about if we want to collect big scale of data of the robot without moving, interacting with one object in a static place versus do we actually want to collect uh, data on the larger scale of a robot operating in a house, um, but maybe not every time second interaction that the robot is having uh, with the environment because we could probably use a lot of prior knowledge in building controllers, which can, um, you know, uh, basically building controllers which can do the low level things while we are dealing with um, high level um, data collection for robotics. I don't know if that makes sense. I'd like to pick up the human side of this that Drew mentioned. I don't think anyone touched on that. I think broadly there's, there's a, at least two ways potentially. Um, from time to time people talk about creating sort of massive interactive environments with people in the loop that are sufficiently gamified to be interesting that people want to be involved and there's, I guess there's that direction. I'm not sure if anyone's made 
you know, very serious attempts at that yet, possibly because our models aren't good enough at, at tasks to be interesting. Um, I think there's various other risks involved with that as well, including the fact that everyone just hates it and nobody sort of joins or participates. The other broad direction is probably trying to leverage um, text and, and image data and, you know, the sort of web resources, but um, using a combination of uh, generative models or even template-based models to sort of rewrite that data into a format that, you know, more closely associates with the, the sort of task that you're trying to learn, I guess. So, I mean, there's, there's a two um, that I've, you know, given some thought to. There's a third one, which is to rely on human-human interaction data, which also has its limitations and kind of uh, part of the new ones there is not, I mean, there's the obvious, which is, well, a human will not act necessarily around a robot the way they act around another human. Okay, cool. Um, but, but there's also sort of something more nuanced and, and I think more coming from the statistical perspective, which is that I can collect a bunch of human-human data. And then if my robot needs to decide on what to do, it's going to have to somehow query that model um, uh, and condition it on these kind of counterfactual hypothetical things that the robot is considering doing and know whether what the human would do in response, right? So in order for the robot to do planning RL, et cetera, with these sort of models, um, you will by definition push them out of distribution because it's not the case that the only thing you'll query them on is the human-like thing that the human that the they interacted with was doing if that makes sense so so it just the, the the trouble with 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 human human interaction is actually not very different from physical interaction that's basically that you have to have collected data where you have explored the space and human-human interaction data doesn't explore the space enough because it's just based on reactions to other human policies. How important do you think the embodiment of the robot is in human-robot interaction data collection? For example, we could collect good amount of data with like, I don't want to say photo, but I wouldn't say photo, but you know, like a uh, uh, face, um, basically a video um, conferencing system or maybe a vector, like a tiny robot that's moving around on the surface. It's easier to collect data with such a simple embodiment versus having a full humanoid robot operating in the space. And do you think that there, I mean, to the panel in general, is there value in such uh, data on simplistic robots? I'd say likely not, not more value than just observing humans, period. Because if what you're looking for is the way people will respond, adapt, react to, move around uh, your robot, uh, they will <laughs> do, they, the task is so different, right? They do very different, they, the, the, the Cosmo or the vector just sits on a table, <laughs> right? And, and so, the table. <laughs> uh, and if you want to think about, well, how will pedestrians walk around my autonomous car? The interaction with, that they have with the, with the Cosmo in their house doesn't really, you know, it, or, or if you want to say you're, you know, you're Sandra and you want the robot that navigates in people's homes, again, the interaction, the data that you collect from just the, uh, it, it's basically, I think it's essentially a, as, which is valuable, but it's as good as kind of putting a camera on people's homes and being able to track them. And then you know how they act in isolation and how they act around each other. And that goes back to my previous point of them in isolation and then around each other is not quite enough from a distribution of data perspective compared to what you typically need for when you put a robot there. Yeah, I'll just add that perhaps it, they just thinking from the human perspective, uh, the realism of the robots like actual embodiment might actually matter less than we typically think. It'll affect the way that people interact with the, uh, the robots uh, because they understand that this has different ways of uh, like physical affordances on the world. Uh, so it might not shake to, you know, try to shake hands with the robot if they, if it's clearly not having an arm, but you know that, you know, we, the way we think about the C3PO versus R2D2 uh, doesn't really depend on, you know, what, how they look, but how they think, think or make decisions and interact and uh, interact in terms of their actions and um, um, verbal behaviors with the humans. So I think that's one thing to consider in terms of thinking about uh, how important the realistic physical embodiment is.
But cues are important, important because if it has eyes, people will assume that it can see. And if it has uh, hands, people will assume that it can uh, like actually physically in, uh, manipulate objects and so on and so forth. So those assumptions that people have about what the robot is capable of doing, I think the, those kinds of features will really affect the way that people initially expect what robots can do. Going a step further and kind of echoing the, the, these two points, humans will behave differently around uh, around robots, and that's robots' reality. We could, we should be able to learn these discrepancies from the observations, from the observations, the baseline that, that Anka had mentioned, and then observing how that differs and changes in these very specific environments, and then using that knowledge and baking it into training, and th that way possibly bridging the gap. Basically, teaching robots to know what to expect. Um, just a thought. All right, we're almost at the time here, so I'm going to go around and have everybody give a kind of final takeaway of what they want the audience to leave with, both from this discussion and kind of from the workshop in general. And so we'll go in the opposite order, starting with you this time. If, Peter, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, well, I guess. Um... Probably the, the takeaway is the same as my, my talk. Um, you know, we should think about how would we get a hundred times or a thousand times more training data um, and, you know, think about synthesizing and generating aspects of the data in order to do that. Akshay? I think, I think the takeaway is that yeah, we're very far away from bringing embodied agents into the real world, right? And there are many unsolved questions for me. Uh, and yeah, uh, maybe collecting a large amount of data, as Peter said, is one way going forward. But yeah, I would also say that we should think about what the space should be that we're collecting data's, data in and how we're we using it. So I think at uh, some point, someone mentioned how do we reuse old data that we have seen before um, and continually keep using it in the future. And things like that. Anka? I'd say for me, it's that we should not think of he, the human role as being just a speed up learning for, for embodied robots, but, but, uh, but really in my mind, they're kind of hold the definition of the task that the robot should be doing. And I think that that's very clear when you talk about assisting people with what they want, but um, it's, uh, I think it's, we're underestimating how, how true that is for almost every robotics task we set out to solve. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I, I agree with everything, including the fact that, uh, I think humans are more important uh, than everyone knows that humans are important, but perhaps even more so, uh, not just in terms of thinking about uh, how to collect large amounts of data, but thinking through how humans are able to make use, uh, a smarter use of that data, and also how they're defining tasks around embodied AI and uh, like providing useful demonstrations, uh, not just to be copied, but to be, again, used in a smarter way so uh, I'm hoping that uh, sort of thinking from the human perspective uh, and trying to embody some of those features into robots and also uh, thinking about the human user side, I think more of that thinking uh, uh, has even bigger influence on the field after this panel. Sonia? Yeah, so I think simulation is really key and super important for embodied agents. And you know, my my personal personal belief is that data driven simulation is really the way to scale these efforts. Sandra, uh, there is a lot that we need to do. It, for first, of all, it's a great discussion. The the takeaway is, is that yes, humans are central, and humans have two major roles in in the embodied systems. One is to provide the data and be the trainers and the other one is to be a teammates and actually part of completion the task and so on 
So on the first end where people are expert, providing expert demonstrations and so on, generative models and automation have really big problems there in bridging this into real gap. And then I think we need a lot more work on the HCI and uh, rubber computer, uh, rubber human interaction. Constantinos? Um, so the takeaway for me is the data is limited and very expensive in the real world. And uh, we need to do more work, more research around the data reuse from, from prior tasks, from, uh, uh, from other robots or environments, including simulations. Um, and also data use uh, from third person uh, imitation. And I think that's something that the vision communities uh, could help uh, could, could help with. Um, uh, you know, bridging the perception of reality gap, utilizing demonstrations from um, other embodiments, and especially humans, and maybe learning uh, actionable uh, and, and general representations. I think the vision community would be really instrumental in, in helping with this. Yeah, so the takeaway that I'd love to convey is that we should try to figure out how to stop throwing away data and, and actually figure out how to uh, reuse data a lot. And I, I think that, unfortunately, I think that doing this will probably require a fairly big paradigm shift where we're no longer using data from our one particular problem and, and trying to solve that one environment and so forth and moving towards a scenario where we might need to be using messy data from other tasks, from other environments and so forth, maybe collected with a slightly different robot, a different action space. Um, and so I think it's going to be hard, but I think it's a, a shift in the way that we think about these problems that is super important for generalization and maybe even inevitable. All right, well, these are some great takeaways. Thank you very much for joining the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your talks. It's been great hosting this. Yeah. And so now we'll kick things back to the rest Thank of the you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.